Okay. Okay. So uh, welcome. Today is a pleasure to have a beautiful seed from David Mellon University. Uh, we, we would like to see to say that uh, we were expecting a Wilfried visit in March 20. 2020. Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> and something happened. So, in the very last moment, this uh, cancelled his visit, but conserved his ticket. <laughs> and so, Wilfred uh, is here with a ticket that we bought in February 20. It's <laughs> 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 quite strange, yeah. but in the reality. So, you kept it. Yeah. Okay, and so Tisa, well, United kept it for me. <laughs> ah, good, good. Uh, Tisa also should make it clear our trust of what is built uh, because they take the engagement to come, and after three years, finally, they can hold his engagement. So, thank you very much, David. <laughs> okay, so for the rest, the talk is exactly as any other one. We have two hours, including the discussion. And if there are clarification questions, I agree that you interrupt him during the talk to ask for a clarification question. And if not, we will have an extensive discussion. Yeah. Okay? So, please. Well, it certainly has been a pleasure to be a champion um, following up on this pre pandemic. So, thank you very much, uh, Marco, for holding up you and Alan Steele. I had intended to analyze Hermann Weyl's dramatic rejection of mathematical structuralism in 1921 when he joined Brauer's Revolution. He was highly critical of Dedekind. Hilbert's view on structural axiomatics and the associated very abstract conception of proof. However, in a manuscript for a talk written around 1953, Weil sketched a balanced perspective of structuralists and constructive approaches to the foundations of mathematics. My analysis was presented, as a matter of fact, in a virtual Zoom talk two years ago. Uh, but it quite clearly, I felt, when rereading matters, it has to be deepened and thus has to wait for another occasion. So instead, I decided to present today the intellectual context for uh, mathematical structuralism through the lens of Dedekind's and, in particular, Hilbert's foundation work. The new title intended to be a little bit provocative, in particular to Marco, is Hilbert's Logicisms in the Context. So, before I start, I wanted to say something about uh, or rather wanted to quote a particular remark by Ernst Cassier. And here's the quote. Historical reflection serves in the end to shape the present and the future. End of quote. Consider this to be the motto for my talk. And let me start with giving an overview of its main threats. So I actually have a handout, but you know, it just gives the structure of the talk, the main parts, and then a list of references for talk, for my talk, and websites for implementations. Uh, so I just didn't want to have all of this on slides. So here we go. Thank 
immediate context of Hilbert's logicism is given by work on the foundations of mathematics over a period of precisely 30 years. Well, that's how I see it. That is right. So let me illustrate no, well, from 1888 to 1980. 30 years. Let me illustrate the logicism at the beginning and at the end of this period, by two quotations. And it is not only the quotation, but also the picture of the author of those remarks. Here we go. Arithmetic algebra analysis is only a part of logic. And who is the man? The author. It's a young version of the idiot. The second, you know the author perfectly well, the quarters, number theory and set theory are only parts of logic. Hilbert had made this remark in his talk, Axiomatisches Denken, Axiomatic Thinking, presented to the Swiss Mathematical Society in Zurich on September 11, 1970. And here you see the assemblage of Swiss and German mathematicians. And in the center, right here, is Hilbert. And a little bit right to the left, this is Helmut Weyer. The remark, number theory and set theory are only parts of logic, did not come out of the blue. Rather, in the summer semester of 1917, so close to the end of the first book, when finishing up lectures on set theory, Hilbert had formulated the programmatic task for the following winter semester of 1917-1918. He wanted to reduce set theory to the laws of logic. He claimed that if we try to achieve such a reduction, we are facing one of the most difficult problems of mathematics. Poincaré has even the view that this is not at all possible. But with that view, one could rest content only if it had been proved that the further reduction of the axioms of arithmetic is impossible. But that's not the case. Next term, that's the winter term of 1917-1918. I hope to be able to examine more closely the foundation. Sorry, which year exactly? This, August of 1917. 1917. Yes. So before he gave the talk in Zurich, and obviously before the start of the winter term 1917-1918. In these 1917-1918 lectures, called Principia de Mathematique, Principles of Mathematics, a reduction to logic was not obtained. Hilbert's attempt to rigorously explore Russellian logicism created, however, the new subject of mathematical logic. By the end of that term, he had set the stage for systematic metamathematics. And here, just let me add a footnote. Namely, for many, the book by Hilbert and Acker, Grundzüge der Theoretischen Logik, that was published in 1928, 20, uh, 28, is the presentation of mathematical 
it formulated, after all, the semantic completeness question that was answered in Gödel's dissertation. However, Gödel's theoretical frame, syntax and semantics, before Tarsal, was explicitly taken over from Hillel and Ackermann's book. The core content of that book, however, is ah, these lectures. Bernays wrote them up very carefully, and literally pages and pages, I would think about 90% of the book by Hilbert and Ackermann are these early lecture notes. So the beginning of mathematical logic, if one takes it to be presented in Hilbert and Ackermann's book, it really has to be shifted by a decade lectures of 1970, 1980. And these lectures are not available. Uh, my colleague, Ben Ebert, and I edited lectures of Herbert's from 1970, 1980 to 1931, unpublished lectures. So, in any event, so just as a footnote, a historical footnote. The lectures have deep roots in the past, as shown by the fact that Hilbert presents in a longish introductory section essential parts of the axiomatic treatment of geometry familiar from his Grundlagen der Geometrie. The first part of my talk describes the roots of Hilbert's perspective under the heading Mathematical structuralism, axiomatics without axioms. The second, much larger section of these lectures is entitled Mathematische Logik, Mathematical Logic. It includes a detailed discussion of the logical calculus of Principia Mathematica and many of these <laughs> systematic connected areas, not only in logic but also in parts of number theory and in others. Such derivations are considered to represent informal, logical, and mathematical proofs. Oh, another footnote. I should add that the people in Göttingen started in 1913 to study Principia Mathematica. And they actually intended to invite Russell to come to Göttingen to present uh, his work on the resolution solution to the paradoxes. But if he write a these, I hope to have to examine more closely the foundation for logic. Yes. And it does it after we read yes. Russell, it means that he's not uh, satisfied with the Russell foundation. So why Russell foundation is not good? Oh, no, no, we'll come to that. So at this point, they had started to read Principia and expected it, as you can see, to be a reasonable logical foundation. Uh, so I also should say that the discussion of the relation in our sense, or in the sense of Principia Mathematica, is at first in Hilbert's step. He had discussed almost every year foundations of mathematics in lectures, but logic was only presented as a sort of algebraic logic in the, in the tradition of Schroeder and Peirce, but in particular Schroeder. So, and this discussion was thought that it may contribute to, to a theory of the concept of the specifically mathematical problem. The second part of my talk focuses on this discussion for addressing Hilbert's consistency problem. It has the title, Mathematical Logic from Models to Proofs. And it leads naturally to the third part, Mathematical Proofs, Objects of Investigation. This direction of proof to investigate in a systematic way, mathematical proofs, that was pushed into the background by the absorbing quest for consistency proofs. And that quest was the most pressing one 
after Gödel's incomplete theorems. The fourth part of my talk, Broad Problems Seeking Solutions, uses my historical perspective to formulate problems that might shape the present and the future. However, it also asks for, deep, for a deepening of the historical perspective. Okay, I suppose, part one. Hilbert's Zürich talk begins with remarks about, and I quote, the general method of research which seems to be coming more and more into its own in modern mathematics. I mean, the axiomatic method. Then, I know. The essence of this method is found when considering relations of mathematics to, I quote again, the neighboring sciences especially to the great empires of physics and epistemology. The relation of mathematics and epistemology is seen through the, quote, epistemological questions with a particular mathematical fit. They are formulated in the last part of Hilbert's talk in Zürich. The solvability in principle of every mathematical question. The subsequent checkability of the results of a mathematical investigation. The question of a criterion of simplicity for mathematical proofs. The question of the relationship between content and formalism in mathematics and logic. And finally, the problem of the decidability of mathematical question in the finite number of operations, that is, algorithmic procedure to decide mathematical questions. Hilbert views the axiomatization of Laundrick as the crowning achievement of the work of axiomatization as a whole. And yet, having listed these questions, he writes, and I quote, we cannot rest content with the exploitation of logic until all questions of this sort and their interconnections have stopped and cleared up. This list has to be extended, of course, by Hilbert's central consistency problem that had been extensively discussed earlier. A proper discussion of the consistency problem requires, however, a deeper understanding of the axiomatic method, as exemplified in Hilbert's foundational work at the turn from the 19th to 20th century, namely Grundlagende Geometrie, and the short subsequent paper entitled on the consequence. In those works, Hilbert gives definitions of structural concepts that apply to systems of objects. In the case of Wittenzahlgriff on the concept of number, he characterizes systems of real numbers via the abstract concept of a complete ordered field. And that is done in a way that is still standard in contemporary experience. Let me describe the case of foundational geometry in summer 2010. Under the heading of that label, explication, explanation, if I tell Hilbert formulates the axioms of geometry. We think three different systems of things. That's a quotation from the English translation, obviously, of foundation of geometry. We think three different systems of things. We call the things of the first system points, antinomial by capital. Latin letters, A, B, C. We call the things in the second system, dimes. And you know, by lowercase, 
let you let us ABC because the things the third system plates and the doctor uh, alpha beta gamma. We think the points, lines, planes in certain mutual relations. A precise and complete description of these relations is obtained by the axis of geometry. In his correspondence with Frege, Hilbert makes it abundantly clear that the axioms of geometry are not axioms in the traditional sense. They are viewed as characteristic conditions of the central geometric concepts that together constitute the theory of geometry. We could say that he introduced the abstract concept of a Euclidean space. Roughly as follows. A triple of systems P and E is Euclidean space, space if there are relations that satisfy the axioms. Having addressed in his letter corresponding to a critical letter of Frege's concerning foundations of geometry, Hilbert returns to what he considers to be the main issue, Hauptsache. The renaming of axioms as characteristic conditions is a pure formality and, in addition, a matter of taste. In any way, it is easily accomplished. This Structure this perspective is not unprecedented. Indeed, it is exhibited in the clearest possible way in Dedekind's essay, Passet und Passo in Zahl. I refer to it as WZ. There, the concept of a simply infinite system is explicitly presented as a structure. It also is under the heading. The essence of a simply infinite system, and this is a quotation from Wiedekind's essay, consists in the existence of a mapping phi of n and an element 1, which satisfy the following conditions alpha, beta, gamma, delta. The first condition, alpha, simply says that the image of n under the mapping phi is enclosed, uh, is part of the subset of, of n. N is obtained as the minimal closure, that's beta sets, of one under the successor operation phi. The element one is not an element of N, and the transformation is similar, and that means. <laughs> You should recognize these are the so-called Bianca's. What is, from this perspective, the science of numbers or arithmetic and its systematic development? It can answer that question in the following way. The relations or laws which are derived entirely from the conditions alpha, beta, gamma, delta, etc., and therefore are always the same in all ordered simply infinite systems, whatever names may happen to be given to the individual elements, form the first object of the science of numbers or arithmetic. So, logical consequences of the characteristic conditions of a beta gamma. That's what arithmetic is all about. In Hilbert's Willenzahlbegriff, one finds a completely analogous remark. He says statements are valid for fields, that is, any system that is a complete ordered field, is valid only, I quote, if one can derive them from the axioms by means of a finite number of logical inferences. But again, 
axioms to be understood as characteristic conditions of an abstract concept. So the systematic development of the respective mathematical discipline proceeds via proofs using as starting points only the characteristic conditions of the structural definition. Lidekind expressed this idea quite beautifully in an 1876 letter to Lipschitz. Letter to so, 1888. Foundations of Geometry. And in the same year also, this essay on the means. So the letter to Lipschitz. All technical expressions, Dedicate use this wonderful term for technical expressions, Kunstmaß, can be replaced by arbitrary, newly invented, up to now, meaningless words. The edifice of a systematic development must not collapse if it is correctly constructed. And I claim that my theory of real numbers withstands this test. When editing this letter in Dedekind's collected works, Emil Luther, an absolute fan of Dedekind, saw in it an expression of Dedekind's axiomatic conception of mathematics. So for both Dedekind and Hilbert, proofs were central for their conception of mathematics. However, neither Dedekind nor Hilbert gave a list of logical steps that can be taken in prose. Dedekind only articulates two general demands on this concept in WC and in a letter to a German colleague called called Kieferstein. Number one, Proving is a stepwise process and small steps to boot. And proofs must not appeal to intuition any way possible. So I'm claiming obviously that Dedekind and Hilbert had a particular perspective on mathematics as a structural. And I wanted to put this in the context uh, of later developments, in particular developments that was done by other practicing mathematicians, that is, Ubaki. In the architecture of mathematics, <laughs> Bourbaki formulates mathematical structuralism in a way that directly reflects the perspective of Dedekind and Hilbert. Indeed, they start out by clarifying what is to be understood in general by a mathematical structure. The common character, and this is a quotation from this article of Bourbaki, of the different concepts designated by this generic name, mathematical structure, is that they can be applied to sets of elements whose nature has not been solved. To define a structure, one takes as given one or several relations into which these elements enter. Then one postulates that the given relation or relations satisfy certain conditions, which are, I explicitly stated, which and which are the axioms of the structure under consideration. Bobaki concludes this passage on structures in general as follows. 
to set up the axiomatic theory of a given structure amounts to the deduction of the logical consequence of the axioms of the structure, excluding every other hypothesis on the elements under consideration, in particular, every hypothesis as to their own nature. So, mathematical structuralism, axiomatics without axioms. Axioms, think of the best characteristic conditions of an appropriate abstract concept. But what else action could be if not that? It could be an a priori truth, and a Frege thought, for example, of the axioms of geometry. That's the contrast. So being a truth, this means that it's a predicate about things that exist and satisfy what is predicated of them. Well, the, in, instead of uh, this version, which is, I am assuming that I have a system satisfying those properties. Yes. Yeah. And I don't know anything about the nature and I don't exactly. care because yeah. that's not the point. To a certain extent, I don't care what those objects are. Yes. So uh, how do you feel then? Um, in 1929, uh, George Birkhoff introduced a system of axioms, four axioms, for the plane geometry where he's incorporating real numbers in the system of axioms. He's introducing ruler postulate, protractor postulate, and so on. Where does this fit in this uh, landscape? Well, I suppose it fits into this landscape very easily, right? Because he's not going with the pure systems. Bringing back the real numbers, it's a it's a slightly different paradigm. But I'm not quite sure whether it is a different paradigm. It's an extended axiom system or system of yeah, characteristic conditions. But uh, you, you oppose these uh, to Frege views for the basic law of uh, arithmetic. The no. basic law of arithmetic contain the, the, the basic law of the book, uh, the, the basic law, the, the seven uh, actions, contain primitive symbols that are defined before, in an informal way, but that are not formally defined within the theory. So then you can take them as true of this function if they consider they exist. This is a purely metaphysical question. The way in which the basic law of work of Frege works is exactly the same like that. They are characteristic condition of the basic function of the Weger script. The fact that the Frege was thinking in another way, this is clear, the correspondence make it clear that Frege had another idea. But operationally speaking, I don't see any difference. Axioms are there. I don't see another possible way to imagine them. Axioms well, are. I responded to your earlier question by saying, what else could axioms be by saying, well, look at Frege and his perspective on the axioms of geometry. They are considered arithmetic truths. Uh, sorry, uh, a priori truths. So that's... But it is required to have a previous definition of the object they speak about. So if you have a previous definition of point, line, you want, so you can not only say that they are true, but they also can make them operate as true. That is, is a, 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 a Euclid perspective, now definition, and then you action. But when you take a definition outside, this is what Frege does in the book of the Greek uh, yeah. definition are, not there, are there, but are there informally. And uh, what they do? I mean, I think. Hilbert and Frege were talking past each other. So they could have arrived at a perfectly satisfactory resolution of their dispute with a little bit of good understanding, good will. Yeah. But, but I mean, there is still one issue where I don't agree with you. If you introduce, for example, 
an abstract concept of a field. You don't give first a definition of the objects that particular definition, that structural definition is bad for, of course. So we use axiom in way. Exactly. So that's My what I want is to that do. I do not see any other way to use axioms. If you have no definition independent of the axiom, of course. Yeah. So yeah. modern axiomatic uh, thinking appear right, on a set idea that axiom can work as definitions. That is the idea that Frege does not accept explicitly, but implicitly accept because it's what he does in his book. So okay. the, only, the only point I wanted to make is that mathematical structuralism in Dedekin never uses the word axiom in a systematic way. He uses it. Uh, for example, when he talks about continuity of a geometric life, he says, this is an axiom you have to accept in geometry. And I suppose there is one other recurrence of the axiom in his collected works uh, that refers to Kant in a way. I don't, don't remember the problem. But that's it. For his own systematic work, axiom, the very notion of axiom doesn't uh, okay. And I wanted by pointing to Bobaki 50 years afterwards, who, as a matter of fact, see themselves in the tradition of Dedekind and Hilbert and Hilbert. Say that that perspective of mathematics that emerged in the second half of the 19th century something quite lovely and has been the mainstay of the foundations of mathematics and mathematical practice ever since. So the next part, mathematical logic from models to proofs. Viewing the formulation and the development of mathematic of a mathematical theory in this structuralist way, Dedekind recognized and addressed a deep foundational issue in W. In his 1889 letter to Kieferstein, he articulated it even more explicitly than in WZ. One has to ensure that the defined concept does not contain internal contradictions. And internal contradictions, that is his well, the German version of internal contradiction. That is achieved by exhibiting a particular system of objects that fall under the concept and thus, in contemporary terminology, are the model of the thing. You can try to do that by establishing the existence of an infinite system and defining from it a simply infinite one. I mean, we know that the argument for the existence of an infinite system is problematic, to say the least, but that's the way you know there. He tries to do this to prove the existence of the infinite system and then can extract from it a simply. This argument is described to Kieferstein as a logical existence proof. Number theory is grounded in logic, that is, in a part of logic that has full comprehension and extensionality as principles. What I think is also very interesting is the fact that Dedekind actually establishes some interesting metamathematical, if you wish, model theoretic arguments, model theoretic and proof theoretic. So he established the consistency via his favorite simply infinite system, called it N. That follows up. <laughs> 
provides that this concept does not have internal contradictions. There is a representation theory, namely that if you have any other simply infinite system, it is isomorphic to n. And that he is, of course, directly categorized. But then he also makes a claim of interesting proof threading fact, namely that if you have two simply infinite systems, they are proof threading together. They establish the same theorems up to a translation of the trading What do you mean with consistency via n? Maybe send the natural number given model. Yes, exactly. Yeah. All of the notion of assembly. Okay. Well, uh, that was not supposed to be there. Hilbert formulated the consistency problem from the very beginning in a different way than uh, than did it. He formulated it as the quasi syntactic. He asked, I assume, how would we detect that a concept contains an internal contradiction? Well, by proving a contradiction from its structural definition. Thus, the concept, system of axioms, is consistent when no proof of a contradiction is possible. The second problem of Hilbert's most famous talk, given at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Paris, 1900, is formulated in exactly that way for the axioms of arithmetic. And that means, in this context, for the concept of a complete audit. So he says there, but above all, I wish to designate the following as the most important among the numerous questions which can be asked with regard to the axioms. To prove that they are not contradictory, that is, that a finite number of logical steps based upon them can never lead to a contradictory design. Hilbert asserts that a consistency proof guarantees the mathematical existence of the concept. The consistency of Euclidean geometry can be reduced to that for arithmetic by defining an analytic model of the geometric theory. For arithmetic, in contrast, a direct proof of consistency is required. Hilbert did not indicate what such a direct proof might be. I conjecture that he thought of directly verifying the criterion of his quasi-syntactic definition of consistency. That is confirmed, I think, by his talk at the next International Congress of Mathematicians in Heidelberg, 1904. He gives there what he calls the first direct consistency proof. It is a consistency proof for a very weak equation of of logic theory. He also claims that it can be extended to full number theory with the induction principle and even to the system. So that was Hilbert's typical optimism on how one can solve problems. The concrete proof given in the Heidelberg talk proceeds by induction on the length of derivations in the given system of number theory. That was, of course, the reason why Poincaré criticized this approach and essentially stopped Hilbert's investigations along such called proof theoretic. That's the general approach of developing logic and arithmetic together, and thus perhaps obtaining grounding in logic, that approach was not given. This involved, of course, answers to two questions. Number one, what are the logical steps that can be taken in mathematical arguments? And two, what are the fundamental logic laws knowing that full comprehension is incorrect? That topic was articulated in the Zurich talk of 1917.
I mentioned the reduction of the consistency problem from arithmetic, from geometry to arithmetic. And Hilbert says in the series of, in only two cases, in this method of reduction to another special domain of knowledge, clearly not a bit. Namely, when it is a matter of the axioms for the integers themselves, and when it is a matter of the foundation of sensing. For here, there is no other discipline besides logic, which it would be possible to invoke. And he continues, but since the examination of consistency is a task that cannot be avoided, it appears necessary to exhibitize logic itself and to prove that was a quotation I showed you at the very beginning. Number theory and set theory are only parts of logic. And the logical laws might be the principles of Principia Mathematica. That is hinted at in the next paragraph. This method was prepared long ago, not least by Frege's profound investigations. It has been most successfully explained by the acute mathematician and logician. Muscle. One could regard the completion of this magnificent Russellian enterprise of the exploitation of logic as the crowning achievement of exploitation. So, how could one prove that number theory and set theory are only parts of life? We are back to the questions I asked about. As Hilbert repeatedly points out, answering that requires a theory of mathematical proofs. All such questions of principle, which I characterized above, seem to me to form an important new field of research, which remains to be developed. To conquer this field, we must, I persuaded, make the concept of specifically mathematical of a, make the concept of specific mathematical proofs itself into an object of investigation. Just as the astronomer considers the input of his position, the physicist studies the theory of his apparatus, and the philosopher criticizes itself. Then he continues. No, not continuing. That's it. That's all I wanted to say. Uh, so, the next slide I can as well skip. I just wanted to point out that there are precursors of proof theory investigation in the 19th century. There's the issue of protective geometry, the duality theorems. Uh, there is Hilbert's 24th problem that was discovered only a few years ago, 10 years ago perhaps, uh, that was not included in the list of problems of the Paris number, uh, in which he wants to have a general theory of mathematical truths. Uh, and then at the very beginning of the 20th century, Paul Malo wrote a dissertation on comparing and evaluating different uh, partition proofs of the Pythagorean theorem. Very interesting. Uh, and so it is not just Hilbert who wanted to have proper theory of mathematical proofs, but also other folks. And other folks did quite concrete work. Okay. Okay, thus, part three, mathematical proofs, objects of this. The purpose of such a theory is clear, but there is no indication of what it could look like. Even in 1917, is still an exactly Frege's fundamental criticism of the 
Namely, nowhere is there a statement. He refers to W. A statement of the logical or other laws on which he depends. And even if there were, we could not possibly find out, find out whether really no others were used, for to make that possible, the proof must be not merely indicated, but completely carried out. Only the 1917-1918 lectures give a clear response of Hilbert to Frege's criticism. And yeah, as you will see, it almost directly responds to those criticisms. Use the calculus of Princi Mathematica to give arguments in Sartansha, monadic, first order logic, and in mathematics with the help of the logical laws articulated in Princi Mathematica. And Hilbert presents matters in this way. Sartansha logic, monadic logic, including, of course, Aristotelian logic, and first order logic. Now we can ask, in a quite rigorous way, which logical laws are actually used when developing number theory or analysis. And in those lectures, it says, not only do we want to develop individual theories from their principles in a purely formal way, but we also want to investigate the foundations of the mathematical theories and examine what their relation to logic is and how far they can be built up from purely logical operations and concepts. And for this purpose, the logical calculus is to serve as an auxiliary tool. And the calculus is particularly well suited for this purpose for two reasons. One, because its application prevents that without being noticed, assumptions are used that have not been introduced as axioms. That's responding to Frege. And furthermore, because the logical dependence so crucial in axiomatic investigations are represented by the symbolism of the calculus in a particular conspicuous way. Without giving details of the formal investigations, let me just report that in these 1917-19 lectures, the least upper bound principle for analysis had been obtained. The literally final remark of the 1917-18 notes concludes from this fact of the proof of the least upper bound principle. It is clear that the introduction of the axiom of reusability is the appropriate means to turn the ramified calculus into a system out of which the foundations for higher mathematics can be developed. That is literally the last remark of those lectures. So, Principia with the axiom of reusability is the appropriate means to turn the ratified calculus into a system out of which the foundations for higher mathematics can be announced. The, the axiom of reducibility is that about the, the types? Yeah, the columns. The collapse of types. So, like what has changed from Russell to Hilbert that this is important? In a certain sense, these 1917-18 lectures are deeply influenced by Principia. The real striking difference is that not only do they develop mathematics and logic, sentential logic, crystal logic, in, a form, in this form of framework. But the important part is that Hilbert 
gives the precise, rigorous mathematical description of that triangle that you don't find in Russell. And he introduces the problem of semantic concepts of satisfiability and so on. Mm -hmm. So, Hilbert is in this tradition of Whitehead and Russell with one this absolutely striking uh, rigorous description of the form syntax semantics all of them. Right, because in, in, in Russell in the in the Brinkipia you do you don't find this distinction of semantics and models or uh, and uh, right. syntactic uh, no. it's just all class uh, yeah. right exactly study yeah. theory of classes yeah. Now, Herbert, in these lectures, makes no judgment whether the problematic goal of reducing analysis to logic has been achieved, when the principles of logic are those of the principiality. That judgment is made after extremely careful and thoughtful analysis in later lectures, and has an Unambiguous answer. No. After all, the axiom of reducibility is judged not to be the logical law. The logicist goal was not reached, but the new idea of mathematical logic was retained. Why is not uh, uh, logic? Well, that's an interesting question. And that would require another lecture to present their arguments. That is, I totally agree that it's not logic. But the point is, what are the Hilbert arguments to say that it's not logic? It's a longer, <coughs> it's, it's a longish discussion. It goes over a whole term. Uh, I think it's still one of the best discussions of the problematic aspect of usability. Uh, the only other very important and interesting discussion of, of Russell as good And the, the answer is not logic as conclusion. <laughs> Russell did not realize the reduction of logic. And from this, does it follow that we cannot realize the reduction or does it follow that we have to abandon type theory in favor of second order logic? We have to abandon of that part of the Russellian enterprise. Yeah. We have to abandon type theory. Yeah. Well, I don't know what the type theory is. Simple type theory might be perfectly fine. And that has developed in Hilbert Dacom. And also. So Hilbert we need Dacom. to abandon ramify this type theory. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the log logicist goal was not reached, but the new idea of mathematical logic was retained. The letter provides a comprehensive frame in which to develop mathematics, and it gives a rigorous definition of that frame. In line with the demand of subsequent checkability of mathematical investigations, it was recognized that the notions involved in the definition of the frame, thus in the consistency problem, must be called constructive. A door was constantly open for refined investigation of formal proofs. That part of mathematical logic is called in 1921 for the first time Hilbert's proof theory and is pursued within finitist mathematics. In lectures of the winter term 1921-22, Hilbert's device theory is introduced. Finitist mathematics is exemplified by developing a little bit of primitive recursive arithmetic. So, in any event, in the, in the lectures of winter from 1921 22, a quite sophisticated, interesting consistency proof 
of primitive recursive arithmetic. It was extended in Ackermann's thesis at the 1928 International Congress of Mathematicians. Some will be delighted to hear in Bologna. Hilbert gave an optimistic description of the status of proof theory. He asserts there the consistency of full elementary number theory has been established by work of Ackermann and von Neumann. The consistency proof for analysis has almost been completed by Ackermann. That's what Hilbert reports. And I mean, if you have never seen this talk of Hilbert's, look at it. It is remarkable that sharpness in which he articulates mathematical problems. Um, I only reported on marks that are over optimistic and Good is incomplete and the cut, of course, in its optimism. Proof theory has been preoccupied with consistency proofs for formal theories ever since. Of course, there also has been a constant watchful eye on mathematical practice. Which part of that practice can be formalized in those things? Scant attention has been paid to the details of humanly intelligent formalization. So it seems to me that the question remains, what is the theory of the concept of specifically mathematical, not formal, logical proofs? Such a theory should live up to Hilbert's 1927 remarks on formalization that, I quote, is carried out according to certain definite rules in which the technique of our thinking is expressed. These rules form a closed system that can be discovered at different times. The fundamental idea of my proof theory is none other than to describe the activity of our understanding, to make a protocol of the rules according to which our thinking actually proceeds. End of As it turns out, the 1921-22 lectures already took a step in the direction Hilbert indicated in this quote from 1927. And before I tell you why there is this step being taken six years earlier, let me jump to remarks Gensen made in his paper of 1936 in which he proved the consistency of elementary number theory using, as you know, induction, transferred induction operators, or not. He makes a remark seemingly of the triviality of formalization easy task. It says, the words of ordinary language are replaced by particular signs. The logical inference steps are replaced by rules that form newly formally presented statements from already proved ones. And then he asserts, the objects of proof theory shall be the proofs carried out in mathematics. Indeed, Gensen views formal derivations as images of the formalism of the mathematical proofs. So back to Hill in 1921-22. Oh, I should say the inference steps, rules that he alludes to in this. Uh, Remark are uh, those of a system of natural reduction. Hilbert, in these lectures from 1921-1922, introduced a new logical calculus that was used throughout the 1920s in proof theoretic work. 
by heaven instead by Alpha, by other folks. I show it to you as formulated in the first volume of Hilbert and Berner's Magnificent Grundlage of Mathematik, published in 1934. Here it is. So, don't look at the first axis of application. They are structural rules of interest. But look at the axioms that are articulated for conjunction and disjunction. There are three axioms for each connector. If you look at axiom five and six, they are elimination, axiomatic formulation of eliminations uh, for other natural reduction calculus, and seven is the corresponding introduction. And similarly, eight and nine are introduction rules for destruction, and ten is axiomatic formulation of making it true. Janssen's natural deduction calculus is a rule-based version of this axiomatic calculus. Just look at the parallelism with Janssen's formulation, what he himself called sequent formulation of natural reduction. So here are the axioms for disjunction, and here are the introduction and elimination rules in against the natural reduction system. The gamma doesn't have any special role. They are just collecting the assumptions on which the formula on the right hand side depends. Instead of looking at the open assumptions at the top of the Two reasons were given for the formulation of Hilbert's two calculus, a methodological one. He emphasized that there should be methodological parallelism to the axioms of geometry. The axioms of geometry articulate definitions of the basic geometric concepts. And here you want to have axioms that articulate basic properties of the logical connectors. That was the methodological one. And then there is a pragmatic one. Hilbert argues, and he had a lot of experience in these matters, that this calculus makes formalization much easier. Sorry? Makes formalization much easier. Very pragmatic way. And Ganson never really emphasized the introduction and elimination character of his rules as distinctive for his natural reduction calculus, but rather focused on the possibility of introducing and discharging assumptions that reflect for him an important aspect of mathematical argumentation. There are, of course, other aspects of mathematical argumentation that are not reflected in Ganson's formulation of the natural natural calculus. For example, that in ordinary mathematical argumentation, we proceed by direction. Very frequently, if you look at a particular statement you want to prove, you say, oh, I want to prove this condition. What do you do? You take the antecedent as an assumption and try to prove the consequence. Similarly, for indirect argumentation, you want to establish what B. So we assume B, obtain a contradiction. So that's from the bottom up. But in any event, that's all I wanted to say about the historical developments of interest. So let me. I suppose 10 more minutes, perhaps. I try to articulate three broad problems 
Perfect. And here I want to remind you of the Cassira remark that historic reflection should help to shape the past and the future. The first problem points to the past and raises historical questions of philosophical interest. As you may have gathered, I consider Dedekind's WZ as one of the most significant foundational works in the second half of the 19th century. It illuminates what Howard Stein called the radical transformation of mathematics in that period. Dedekind's work is rooted in Göttingen's mathematical and philosophical tradition. For mathematics, there is a direct connection to Gauss as his teacher, to Riemann as a very close friend, and to Dirichlet as another teacher and collaborator. For philosophy, the connection is more indirect when Dedekind mentions the preface to WZ, his Habilitationsrede of 1854. The methodological part, first half as a matter of fact, of the Habilitationsrede is influenced by Herbert, Kant's successor in Königsberg, via Riemann, and a philosopher who at that time was the professor of philosophy in Göttingen, Hermann Lotze. Lotze's influence is especially important, as he considered mathematics to be a part of logic and viewed the novel theory of conceptual abstraction as his most important contribution to logic. That theory of abstraction is employed in WC when dealing with the Here, I think, we should simply seek a deeper understanding of that part. That is, obviously for once, philosophy had an impact on mathematical practice. Let's try to find out what this really is. I have some inkling, but only an inkling. I think there are interesting philosophical, historical philosophical issues that can be and should be addressed. The second problem concerns the present. It seeks a philosophic analysis of the remarkable reductive work that has been done in proof theory over the last half century, 50 years. The work I have in mind gives relative consistency proofs of classical theories to construct it. For example, the subsystems, sub subsystem of analysis that has the comprehension principle for just pi one one formulae was reduced to the intuitions theory of finite number classes, perfectly acceptable theory from an intuitionist perspective. The constructive principles are a dramatic expansion of finitist mathematics. This modified, expanded consistency program was given expression by Paul Gallus beginning in the mid 1950s. He put great emphasis on a narrowly arithmetic generation of mathematical objects motivated by Berners' considerations and then recent proof theoretic work. I introduced the concept of accessible domains. Such domains are generated by deterministic inductive definitions that include natural numbers, logic concepts, concept of formulas and proofs, constructive ordinance, but also segments of the cumulative hierarchy of sets. For each of these domains, proof by induction and definition by structural recursion hold. This fact allowed my student Patrick Horch to give a category theoretic characterization of the accessible domains as initial algebra of certain end of factors. But how do we analyze 
these different levels of constructivity, philosophically speaking, that should be done. Again, I have an inkling, but there is real work to be done. The third problem connects present and future by raising contemporary issues that are potentially of deep philosophical interest. It happens that is also rooted in Göttingen. Through a mathematician, you only know from a different context. I suppose both of you. In the context of categories, yeah. The man, I'm. Yes, yes, why? I know that Saunas McLean was a Göttingen, right, at some point. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's the person I want to refer to. He was a student of. Berners. Then when Berners was pushed out by the Nazis, uh, Hermann Weil took over as his uh, advisor. And the title of his thesis, in English translation, is Shortened Proofs in the Logical Calculus. What he tried to do is quite straightforward. He wanted to have certain mechanical operations that allow you to isolate the interesting parts of proofs and leave the rest to mechanical stuff. And that's what we tried to do. Uh, it was not exactly a dissertation that had big influence. In 1935, the Sonnes McLean gave a summary of his dissertation. And in the summary, it says, proofs are not mere collections of atomic processing processes, but they are rather complex combinations with a highly rational structure. And more than 40 years later, looking back at his dissertation, he makes the following remark. There remains the real question of the actual structure of mathematical proofs and their strategy. It is a topic long given up by mathematical logicians, but one which still properly handled might give us some real insight. I suppose that the confluence of two developments has made it possible to follow the claim and take steps towards a theory of mathematical proofs. And I think there is, first of all, the proof rate investigations in the tradition of Gensel's book on natural induction. In particular, crucial for this enterprise are normal form theorems. And secondly, the computer implementation of mechanisms that construct humanly intelligible proofs. Now, that is not exactly an emphasis by people who work in automated theorem proofing. You want to get a proof, whether it's intelligible, whether you can actually read it as a proof, that's not important. You have a yes or no answer, and then you can read a long list of lines that constitute. But I think if one wants to get to a theory of the specific, the notion of specifically mathematical proof, then something else has to be done. You have to focus on human intelligibility from the very outset. Small step in that direction, I took with Patrick Walsh, the student I mentioned. We formalized the Cantor-Darmstadt theorem. And we did that in ZF-Sat theory, as implemented in my a system that is by direction. What is the outcome beyond just formalizing? Firstly, you can actually read the proofs 
the final proof, using of course Lambert, but had been established long ago, is 13 lines long and articulate facts that are of independent mathematical interest and come into the But what is mathematically interesting, I think, is that our formaliz formalization and the analysis of many, many different, presumably different proofs of the Kanter Bernstein theorem reveal that the large variety of proofs of the Kanter Bernstein theorem really can be boiled down to two. There is Wiedekind's proof from 1887 and Samuel's proof from 1908. They are identical in our formalization, except for making at one point a crucially different in it is the move to make an inductive definition explicit. And those ways of making the inductive definitions explicit allows us to compare in a mathematically meaningful way those two proofs. Namely, if you look at the monotone operator that is associated with inductive definition, then Dedekind's way leads to the minimal fixed point of this operator, whereas Zermelo's produces the maximum fixed point of this operator. Okay. So, I'm almost done. Don't worry. Uh, I just wanted to point out that the APRIS system, which we did this interactively, is not only an interactive theory prover, but <clears throat> is an automated proof search mechanism that exploits the structure of normal proofs in natural reduction calculi to strategically find a proof if there is one. Okay, two final controlling remarks, short. Number one, I think at the intersection of proof theory, automated proof search, and interactive theory proving, we have real opportunities to explore the structure of mathematical proofs and experiment with strategies for constructing. In this way, we can begin to approach a theory of the concept of the specifically mathematical proof or uncover the rational structure of proofs that we claim to understand. Number two, and that goes back to the title of my talk, Hilbert rejected, as we saw, Russell's logicism, but he retained the agents. In one of his last talks, called Hockey Game 1913, uh, at a conference called uh, Knowledge of Nature and Object, he simply made this assertion. The axiomatic method is part of And with this, finish and thank you. Let me show you one colorful proof. This is a time right here. Yes. Nice. You know the book is a fantastic. Mm -hmm. This is a, 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 a rewriting of the Euclid the element by colors and using uh, just the color instead of symbols. It's it's really wonderful. And this is a, a, a proof of the theorem. Yeah. Is... I mean, sometimes it's not exactly correct. So here, for example, there is a steps missing that are done in Euclid's book. But no, it's. Uh, Presentation in this colorful way of the first response of you. And it was just wonderful. It was 
done by uh, an Irishman called Oliver Byrne, and the book was published. Now, this is uh, an interactive web page that uh, in which you, you you find all these pictures and and follow the proofs and uh, you can click and uh, seriously I don't know that. yes you oh. can click for example on the black line and then everything else is dim so that the black line is evident where it is in the picture oh god that's wonderful it is very beautiful and very well done okay so where do I I think that if you uh, uh, search for this book <coughs> Uh, you, search, you introduce some uh, co um, some word like uh, interactive uh, uh, web page. Uh, I think you would be okay. able to find right. it. Oh, if I can maybe write you an email. Sure, that would be wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Really. <clears throat> Question, remark, criticism, objection, protestation. Uh, I'm curious. The Outcross system. Yeah. Uh, uh, what logical framework does it use? Is it First order logic or higher it's order? It's first order logic. logic. Yeah. Natural deduction and first order logic. Yeah, but natural deduction in a different, different way. Mm -hmm. So the logical formalism actually allows forward and backward argumentation. Mm -hmm. So what I said that is what is viewed as a very important reflection of mathematical practical argumentation, uh, the backward steps they can be taken. And also, not just in the interface, but the automated theorem proof uses them. That is quite, a, quite efficient. And has pedagogical applications. Other questions? You mentioned at some point, uh, I don't know if it is a Hilbert quote or it is his idea that consistency guarantees exist. Oh, I heard mathematical concept. Yes, yeah, I heard that many times, but I, I still don't understand what it means. Well, uh, it is sometimes not just asserted what Hilbert asserts in the formulation of the second problem in this Paris talk. Consistency for an abstract notion guarantees the mathematical existence of that concept. Frequently it says, oh, it guarantees the existence of a system that satisfies the axioms. And as far as I can make out, that is not, but this not right in here. Okay, so this this will be, for example, the work of Scholem uh, making from the language, from the formal language you could construct. I mean, if you have a, a if you have a consistent theory, yeah. you take the language, and from that language, you can construct a structure that says you can construct a model. Exactly. But this is not what Hilbert was saying. That's not my understanding. I see. No. It's just that the, the mathematical concept exists. Yeah. It has some sort of mathematical existence. I'm not quite sure what that really means. Mm -hmm. Right. Being uh, a mathematical legitimacy? Yeah, maybe Perhaps. That, yes. But in any event, in order to take the second step, you point it correctly to school and of course that's was done for first level logic with mm -hmm. complete design. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the title is logicisms plural. I was trying to track how many does how many logicisms does Hilbert have? Well, as far as I can make out two. So it's a very weak plural. <laughs> <laughs> To do all. One of them, you, you so, finished. Sorry. So that's Dedekind, and whatever falls there under the concept logic, <laughs> I'm not completely sure. And then it's Russellian logicism, Russell's mm. logic, in principle. Yeah. Okay. I'm completely new to this subject, but. Uh, as you're talking through these various mathematicians and these lineages yeah. of thought, uh, where do Vale and uh, 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 Brown fit in re relative to Hilbert? Uh, go ahead. That so a very big, a very big name. No, I'm remarkable interest. 
you know, has been mathematician and philosopher. Uh, well, first of all, he was a student of Hilbert. Uh, and also, remarkably, in spite of his deviant position, became a successor in Göttingen. So, how does he fall into the broad characterization of foundational schools? We tried already in 1918 to develop analysis in a very restricted framework. The book in which he does this is called Das Continuum. And that was analyzed in the 80s and 90s by, among others, uh, by Basol Pfefferman and many other folks. And if one articulates Weil's framework in a mathematically precise way, then one can show that it is conservative over piano arithmetic, so an extremely weak theory. Uh, and thus, in a certain sense, also justified from the intuitionist point, if you take into account that piano arithmetic can be reduced to hiding arithmetic, and so if you take arithmetic for granted, then you have classical arithmetic as consistent with this theory. So, but uh, in 1921, he published a paper uh, that is, what is it called? Über die neue Grundlagenkrise der Mathematik, the new foundation crisis of mathematics. And in it, I alluded to it very briefly at the very beginning. Uh, he takes a very critical perspective on Dirichlet in particular and the notion of this abstract that is involved in Dirichlet. He thinks intuitions have to account for truths. And that's the main reason why he joins Rao's revolution. And later on, when Hilbert's finitist program had been articulated properly, and I mean just as a footnote, this paper was published and written before a version of Hilbert's finitist program had been articulated. Uh, so when Hilbert had formulated such a the good version of the finitist program. Weil stepped back from being such an ardent supporter of Brower's and in the in a paper that followed a talk of Hilbert's in Hamburg in 1927, from which I quoted incidentally. I, He said that Hilbert is right in doing this, and Hilbert is wrong in doing that. And Brower's philosophy of mathematics and mathematics is cumbersome and is not the appropriate framework for application of the sciences. And, but, he wanted to pursue mathematics in a reason, reasonably constructive way. But it was only in this last paper I'm aware of, it's not really a paper, we talk, but he took it in 1953, in which he tried to articulate a perspective that joins the abstract way of doing mathematics in the 
dedicate urban and an urban way to constructive approaches. Interesting. There is a question by Bruno Benson. Bruno, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you can you guys hear me? Okay. So possibly it's a lot of time that you have your eyes at your hand, but I only see so it now. So sorry. So no, it's can... fine. Uh, okay. Uh, so first of all, Vifred, uh, thanks for for the talk. It's a pleasure to see you uh, again. Uh, so I'm particularly interested in this fascinating picture you painted of Hubert's logicist claims. And I was wondering in what sense uh, does he, uh, well, he means when he speaks of a reduction of the arithmetic of integers and set theory to logic. Because, well, in, in logicism, there are typically two senses in which a reduction takes place. You have a reduction of concepts and a reduction of, um, well, to concepts to logical concepts and a reduction of uh, Emphasis to the emphasis of uh, first order logic, uh, and well, at least in in Hubert's case, it seems to be first order logic, and it seems that he's more interested in the second part and not very much in the first. So to put it into perspective, for example, and compare um, you know, Hubert's uh, views from 1925 in the on the infinite, it seems that uh, the way that he explains how the natural numbers are given to us. There's a clear appeal to intuition that does not seem to leave much room for logicism left. So I was wondering if he, maybe he changed his views, maybe because of uh, you know his reflection on the axiom of reductibility that he were talking about. So, oh yes, of, of course. I mean, the change. Uh, first of all, hi Bruno. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice to nice to hear your voice. Um, so. The logicism, the Russellian version of logicism, that was articulated in the lectures 1970-1980. In subsequent lectures, 1919-1920, Hilbert and Bernays pursued different avenues. There is, first of all, an absolutely radical constructive way of pursuing mathematics, much more radical than finitist mathematics. And it is only then that uh, finitist mathematics is introduced in mm -hmm. a more open way that allows variables and induction uh, and so on. So in 1925, there was no remnant of logicism in England. Absolutely not. Yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah. So uh, I was wondering then if uh, you know at at least at that moment of his career, where in which Hubert was playing with logicism, didn't he have? more of a deductivism picture in his head, or he was really interested in reducing the concepts of, um, um, well, arithmetic of integers and set theory to logic, or he was only interested in, uh, you know, deductivism or reducing inferences to the inferences of uh, rules of inference of first order logic. Before, the 1917-1918 lectures, mm -hmm. there is no articulated deductivism mm -hmm. in here, but with a precise mathematical calculus, a logical mm -hmm. calculus. Mm -hmm. That was introduced only in these lectures, mm -hmm. following essentially Francisca Mathematica. Before that, he talks about finite logical steps, but what those logical steps are, he does not say. It's only in the 1970, 1918 lectures. Right. That's terrible. Thanks, you for it. Well, thank you for it's your Nice advice. to see you. Good to see you. So I also have uh, two questions. One uh, is not the 
yes, it's connected to our talk, but it's a, a little bit marginal, and the other is more on the point. It clearly say what you say that the, the uh, Foundation geometry is an example of axiomatic method in which a sense is considered. Yeah. But when it develops its own view about uh, a consistency, that is proof theory, yeah. uh, it should have made, uh, it should have seen clearly that it cannot apply its proof theory to the system of uh, geometry because it's not formalized. So there is no way to apply his conception of, of analyzing the proof as an object on the case of geometry. So he never was coming, he never had the idea to come back and to formalize his uh, 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 foundational geometry. This is something that he never tried to do. It, it wouldn't be natural to say, okay, I have started a, 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 a road. I start in a certain way. This road made me arrive out here. Now I understand that I can apply, I can study proofs as such, but I cannot study proof as such if the proofs are the ones that I gave in my foundational geometry. So I should change something in my foundational geometry in such a way that I can apply to the original uh, example of an axiomatic method, the conclusion that I arrived to. He did not do that. Is that not strange? Um, well, first of all, I think I have a slightly different conception conception of what Hilbert means to consider mathematical proofs mm -hmm. as objects. So in the excellent presentation, informal presentation, you could think of having a formalized theory as the theory for this mathematical, mathematically developed formal part of geometry. So in, in the way in which physical theories aspects of Physical reality, formal frameworks, formal systems could be used as depictions of intellectual experience, the precise experience. Mm -hmm. That's... Yes, but uh, so it would, uh, it would have been natural for him to try to give a formal uh, axiomatization of job. It would have been very easy. So if, if you think that this idea is too easy not to do that because clear enough to do it. No, I think I think other issues were the preoccupation. I mean in the period between nineteen eighteen and nineteen twenty one, twenty two, he had first of all other interests, not just logic and foundational mathematics. And then he wanted to articulate why do I think the ex movido spelling is not a logical principle? That's, he spent the whole term with dumbness to discuss this. And then the slow evolution to a finitist person. And a genuinely interesting proof of the consistency of primitive recursive. I mean, it's sort of stunning, it comes out of nowhere. So there are simply other preoccupations, I think. Okay, so it's simply a question. I, okay, I think something else. But the preoccupation is not completely independent because, you know, geometry is a typical example of axiomatization. Yes, I mean, in the 1970, 1918 lectures, I think there are about 250 pages. The first 50 pages of it present a summary of interesting aspects of the axiomatization of geometry. So, and then it starts with mathematical logic. And clearly, instead of worrying about analysis, he could have said, look, let's look at what we can do. 
for geometry. But on the other hand, you know, there's reduction of geometry to analysis, so why not focus on that part of our okay. intellectual so, so the other the other question much more connected to your talk. So he rejected thus logicism because uh, axiom of uh, reducibility is not a logical axiom. But uh, the axiom of reducibility is not the only axiom of the Wikipedia, and is also not the only non-innocent axiom of the principle. Yeah. Uh, there is also the axiom of infinity, for example, yes. that is a problematic, and even the, 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 the axiom for extension. It's true that if you have type theory, uh, the, 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 the basic of five Newton within of Newton, the speaking of Newton is afternoon with uh, Daniel. The, 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 the basic law pipe of Newton is harmless from the point of view of contradiction if you have a theory, but still does not make this does not make it a, a innocent uh, law. So Hilbert is only interested in action of reducibility, say nothing about other action of uh, Russell uh, system that could not be logic in a, a certain sense. That is the crucial part. Yes. That's For him, the point is that it was similar. I mean, he wanted to give a foundation to classical mathematics, particularly also set theory. So he used the explanatory there. So why say it is problematic in principle? Well, that was not very coherent. <laughs> yes. But in the end of the story, that's what they do not understand. What would have been for him to reduce uh, uh, arithmetic or set theory to logic? He would have been uh, look at uh, Russ and say, okay, that's work. Uh, so what is it? So you say then the axiomatic method is part of logic. That's what he said in that. Okay. So yeah. it seems to say that mathematics is not a logic, but the method of mathematics used is inspired by logic in some sense. Yeah. So if we make abstraction of the content of the axiom, we think we take the axiom of the form, all that remain a logical system. What makes them is not logic, is the axiom of a content that is not a logical one. Yeah. Is the idea. I think that's the yeah. idea. Okay, and so to reduce mathematical to logic would have <coughs> been the same as to have no axiom that has a, log a mathematical content, and so to avoid all mathematical axiom in favor of pure axiomatic, uh, logical axiom. This is the, the, the point? So this would have been a reduction? I, I think so. I mean, in the same way in which we reduce number theory to set theory. But, I mean, that can be can be done. But I think okay, this is a... okay. That was the attempt of doing things. Yeah. This is not possible, so we have to go in another way. It is ideal object. No, that I didn't understand. But the other way is. Yeah. Uh, Proof theory, yeah. but the proof theory, uh, uh, as uh, when it developed, is uh, is uh, proof of consistency of constructive arithmetic. Uh, constructive arithmetic has no axioms because that what is what the, the object that it speak of are directly the sign that we are working on. Okay, so it's a very particular case. But when we want to make uh, arithmetic, uh, uh, a little bit of richer arithmetic, not finitistic arithmetic, but infinitistic arithmetic, we need to introduce axioms. And we have to go out from the idea that the natural number is simply this concrete sign. And that these axioms are a mathematical uh, content, but they speak of ideal elements. So it means, uh, to say it another way, the, 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 the proof of consistency of constructive arithmetic works very well, but works very well on a very pure, a very poor uh, arithmetical theory. And uh, uh, the fact that this arithmetical theory is poor 
Uh, it depends on the fact that there's no axioms in the end of the story. So the object are directly a sign that they see in front of me. In order if I want to enrich a theory and to make infinitely arithmetic, I need to do something else. I need to explain what the natural number are and not only to show natural number a system of strokes. And to show what natural number are, I need to give axioms. And those axioms introduce ideal element, etc. 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 I don't know where the ideal element uh, elements come mm -hmm. come in. Uh, but I mean in the way in which Herbert and Berners conceive of finitist mathematics that is not just concerned with numbers. Uh, that's a very special case. I mean, in the consistency arguments, in the metamathematic description, there is no arithmetization of notions. The concept of a formula, the concept of a proof, that is taken as the height of finitist mathematics. I understand, but finally, it constitutes a proof, the proof the symbols, form and system. Sure. And what I work on, I work on a system of symbols that right. stay together in a certain way. Right. Now, I work on the symbol independently of whether <laughs> the symbols have a certain meaning or not when I work for them. That's exactly right. okay. But now, when I make uh, uh, I make uh, uh, finitary arithmetic, it is uh, uh, the system of strokes. The symbols are directly the numbers. So I have no separation between the number and uh, the symbols. A, a, a number is simply a collection of strokes. Point. There is no discussion. So I have no necessity of an axiom that tell me what is a natural number because a natural number is there. Okay. So now I can directly work on sign, and working on sign, I also work. on on numbers. But when I want to have a, even arithmetic literal region, so I want to define exponential, for example, so I want to go a little bit farther than this, this that I cannot say that number is just this. Number are the object that satisfy time actions or something like that. And so now my system of sign are no more, the sign themselves are no more than number. Yes. So now I have another operation. I have to take a system of sign that has a content that does not express directly the object to work on the system of sign and to see that the system of sign is coherent, but this is something else because now I'm speaking of sign, not of mathematical objects. The mathematical objects are the number and the number are no more the sign. You see what I want to say? No, I'm not. No, not so I say, let, let's say, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the case of the active arithmetic, this is a number. Okay. This is a number. This is a number. Okay. And then when I want to make a proof, the number, I work on this object here. But you give a systematic particular presentation. I give a systematic presentation. My, my object are signed. Mm -hmm. I see that the sign mm -hmm. Now, when I want to go farther, but you have implicitly a successor operation. I have a successor success operation. operation. No, no, of course. I have a successor operation. But the successor operation is simply an operation from here. Here. Yeah. Huh? This is a sign, and this is a design, and this is simply an abbreviation. But this, this is an abbreviation of a sign like that. I have something else. And from here, I go to. Okay. So, what are number, 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 Now, if I want to have a richer. The 
Sí, sí, sí. Y I argued about this historically. I'm not Quantic. I should suppose I could do a book. This is supposed to be part of And you open it up. Yes. There are strokes on the yeah. first page. Yeah. Initially, there are strokes on the first page. When in 1920, yeah. you know, I discussed I'm not cheating. a very radical perspective, which is not giving you a perspective. There well, are no I'm telling you that every time you look at it, okay. you ask just me what's the predecessor of the of the In other words, it could be a stream. That was done and in five years. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And you have. You got to decide. Locally, it looks like a perfectly reasonable yes. number, but it's an opposite process that will produce a more generated formula. And then you can again, you'd have to get the other. But when you think of that, it's clearly has not an infinite stream. In this way, you can make only a part of a yeah, and that was quite clear, right? I mean, that was an objective of him to give a foundation for theory in terms of a consistency, which is where you can just place on a more elementary part of mathematics of elementary Yes, Ah, okay. This elementary part, according to your reconstruction, is the part on which the consistency proof should have based. So I have now given an elementary. This is as elementary, but it's the starting point. So I have to reduce my proof to this elementary part. So this is not just a part of arithmetic. This is a part of arithmetic, but a part of arithmetic has a particular role in the, in the building because it is the part on which I can reduce the rest to have the consistency proof. Yeah, but, but I mean, that's quite right. That's okay. Oh, except that I was emphasizing that in finitist mathematics, you not just have natural number theory. You don't do just arithmetic, but you do also other things. Okay. okay. And okay. The consistency proof they give in legislative okay. you know, they are operating on proofs, they are transformations on proofs, and all of this is considered okay. to be finite. Okay. Other questions? Hi, Hi, this is John from Carnegie Mellon. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Um, I have a comment about and a question about your work on the Cantor Bernstein. Well, really yeah. First, the comment it's interesting the two proofs that your work isolated where neither of those proofs were by Cantor or Bernstein. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I mean, no matter that's my sometimes highly rational. We need to come to can't have formulated the problem, but he couldn't prove it. Bernstein proved it, but in a very peculiar way, taking for granted natural numbers. And that would, of course, be a disaster for DDI. Mm -hmm. to, to use the natural numbers. Yeah. So who gave was it Russia? Russian? Who, who you mentioned it? No, no, no. The work he isolated. Schroeder. I can repeat what you said, yes. or you can Schroeder. say Schroeder is um, credit. I assure credit. that you assure that, right? He gets credit for kind of cleaning it up, I think. Okay. No, as a matter of fact, Schroeder's proof was found to be lacking conclusiveness by Corset, another German mathematician. So the proof was not correct. So, was it Tarski who proved the, the, the theorem in, in, uh, in, this, in this way of that you have a monotone operator, then you have a 
Wo ist das? That's exactly the fixed point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cluster and transfer. But the original versions <laughs> they were given by Dedeke in 1887 while he was working on Russell and Russell and Russell. And that's all. He didn't know anything about that proof of, of Dedeke. So the Dedeke proof was made public only. In 1932, yes, yeah. uh, collected works yeah. okay. by Emil Luther. Okay, so why, why do you say that it's two distinct yeah. proofs then? Because they're both a proof that they both say uh -huh. there is a fixed point for this monotone operator. Uh, and from there on, the proofs are the same, are they not? Uh, no, no. Okay. There is no fixed point, there is no monotone operator. In their proofs, they make explicit. No, but you said that earlier. You said this came down to two separate proofs, one of which uses a maximal fixed point and one of which uses a minimal fixed point. No, oh, I misunderstood. No, no, no. I, I most likely did not express properly what I intended to say. So there are these two ways of. Proving the counter downstream theorem. Leaving aside taking for granted natural numbers and not operating with all sharp methods. One proof was given by Hedeke, the other one somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the difference between those proofs is the way in which inductive definitions are made explicit. I see. Okay. In the one case, Dedekind's way, if you look at the corresponding marginal operator in the Tarski way, then Dedekind's way is the minimal fixed point of the operator, and Salmelo's way. Yes. So if you translate into yeah. the tone operator language, yeah. it gives you these two. Exactly. I think that's an interesting yeah. fun observation mm -hmm. that there are really distinct in a deeper mathematical. Yeah. Well, that says something about intelligibility, maybe, because um, maximal and minimal uh, fixed points are intelligible to us in, some way, in a way that saying just give me some some fixed point is not right. When you look for fixed points, you're looking for a theorem that says that exists. And those theorems are almost always minimal fixed point, point theorems or maximal fixed point theorems. Yeah, that's quite true. Yeah. Wow. This is this connects to my question. And the question I had in the work with the Cantor Bernstein theorem that human intelligibility was central to the uh, analysis. So how how was it exactly? I might have missed it when you talked about it. How exactly is human intelligibility um, factored into the analysis or given a place in it? So we actually start just the axes. That's it. So then there is a slow increase in the conceptual difficulty of issues, right? You start out with the absence, you introduce um, basic sets of operations, policy, yeah. union, what happens, then you introduce functions, particular kinds of functions, and then you can actually formulate the counter downstep there. And so it is the slow increase of concept yeah. of complexity that is the background. And you establish facts concerning subjective functions. And then those facts you establish, and facts that are mathematically interesting, independent of the fact that they can be used independent of the counter yeah. yeah. you use them. Uh, so, this reminds me of your software stack. So, comments. Part of the story is the, uh, the definitions, the, the conceptual framework, in the background. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think without you, there's just nothing to be done. So, understand. To think that you can write a proof that starts with the axioms and doesn't appear to anything but the axioms. To get it, tell me how to improve the counter theorem. Just formulate the counter theorem in elementary 
saturated terms just using epsilon. Just what I mean. It's just. Well, and that's the detail or the yeah. elaborated what you're talking about. Okay. The paper you have here in the reference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You can but look at. I mean, yeah. obviously not all the no, really some lemmas and lemmas and propositions are in that paper, but there's a website. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. For you. Let's go from a dinner, a beer, or something. <laughs> I would love to talk to you. No, I think you want to die for the twelve o'clock brain, so for you. Oh, come on, I got it. Let me check the space. The dogs are dashed. I usually you guys go. Well, you've really got the provisions first. You know, provisions in count. If you if you walk down, yeah, you walk down. That's before you hit.